Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emmanuel Baptist Church. And uh, this morning, uh, we're still in our, our uh, online format. Uh, it won't be long before we'll be back together, uh, seeing each other face to face. But in the interim, we'll take advantage of the technology that God has given us uh, in this crazy uh, COVID moment that we find ourselves in. So I hope that you've come prepared uh, to engage this morning. So I want to encourage you to have your Bible uh, and some something to write down some notes on, uh, or uh, if you have pulled the notes off the website or taken them out of the email from Barb, I want you to encourage to get those uh, and have those ready uh, as we'll be digging into that. That will help you not only to remember what we're talking about today uh, for further discussion uh, uh, among the people that you're with, uh, but also to help you to apply and uh, use the material. So we're in our series on doctrine, uh, and we're talking about it. We've titled it Following the Map, uh, Following God's Directions for Life uh, through, through uh, what He teaches in Scripture. And here in particular, we're looking at the manual uh, that lays out the map. We're looking at the branch of theology that's often referred to as bibliology. Biblios meaning book. Logos meaning a discourse or account about the book. And here we mean the Bible itself. And so we've talked about a number of things about the Bible already, and today we want to look at, as you can see on the screen, how should we interpret our Bibles. So here is a classic verse that anybody who uh, has been around the Christian world for any length of time uh, has heard uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, quoted. It says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a, workman, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. I remember it from my King James days, a study to show yourself approved, a workman who need not be ashamed. But here's a, an encouragement from Paul to Timothy, his protege, uh, to be someone who studies his Bible, but also someone who correctly handles it. And so that's what we want to talk about. What does it mean to correctly handle the Bible? How do we interpret the Bible? Especially in a moment where there's all kinds of people using the Bible and seem to come up with opposing ideas from it. Now, if you're around Christians, one of the things that's true is that we are people of the book. And so we are people whose lives revolve around the teaching of the Scriptures. And so here's a quote from, from John Wesley, a famous preacher uh, from the... Uh, 18th century, uh, God used powerfully uh, in what the, the growth of what came to be called Methodism, but God used him not only as a teacher, but as a preacher to bring many, many people to Christ. And so here's, here's his words, famous words, I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach the way for this very end he came from heaven. He has written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let it be, let me be a man of one book. So, uh, we are people of the book. Now, what we've learned so far about uh, the Bible itself as we've worked through these various messages, some by myself, some by Pastor Steve, well, one of the things that we've learned about our God is that He's revealed Himself and His truth to humanity. So, as Francis Schaeffer was famous for saying, God is there and He is not silent. So God has spoken. He wants to be known, so He's revealed Himself and uh, His truth to humanity so that we can understand Him, ourselves, and the world in which we live. And God did this through authorized agents. He, he took some of that revelation, not all of it, God has revealed, matter of fact, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul refers to many visions and insights that God gave to him, unique to him as an apostle, uh, that he, some of them he did not record, uh, apparently by God's direction. But some of that revelation, he got authorized certain agents to put some of it down in writing for the people of God through the ages. And so it was God's pattern uh, to act in the world and then authorize an agent in the Old Testament, it was prophets, in the New Testament, it's apostles and those closely associated with the apostles, and so they're located in a particular era, and God entrusted this message to them to explain his character, his acts, and his purposes. Now, what we know about the process of that is that the Spirit superintended their writing so that while preserving and utilizing their individuality, 
right? So when you read the books of the Bible, uh, Isaiah doesn't sound like Peter, and Peter doesn't sound like Paul, and Paul doesn't sound like Matthew. They're individuals writing with their own vocabulary and their own styles, and their historical particularity. They wrote in the languages they knew. They wrote at the time in which they lived. So God came together with their personalities. He didn't dictate the Word of God. It's not a God-speak, uh, some sort of language as if they were auto-writing and God possessed them and all of a sudden they woke up at two hours later and there was the book of Matthew. No, God worked through them as individuals. And so as the result was they composed and recorded without error his message to humanity in the words of the original writings. So God worked, and we have talked about that as inspiration, the process of inspiration, which tells us about the character of the Bible and how we got the Bible. Now, last time, uh, uh, not a couple weeks ago, Pastor Steve talked about the canon. And here we talk about the Spirit has guided God's people to recognize, collect, preserve, and submit to the teaching of those books, the canon, until Christ returns. So this answers the question, the Spirit's guidance, why we have these 66 books and not other books, and why we look to these books, these 66, as the authoritative rule or guide for the people of God. So that's what we've learned so far about the nature of the Bible itself. And it's important that we start there because what the Bible is shapes how we approach the Bible. It's important here, and we're going to come back to that. So the question that's in front of us today, though, is how do we interpret this Bible? Right? How do we go about interpreting it? And many people have different ideas about this. And the issue of interpretation is something that's front and center in the public life, in America in particular. Uh, if anyone pays attention to all of the to's and fro's politically about uh, su uh, Supreme court, court appointments, uh, one of the key things about the Supreme Court is how does that particular judge that's going to be a nominee how do they view the interpretation of the Constitution? So you have people that are originalists who say that they should interpret the, the Constitution in accordance with the framers or the author's intended meeting. So that needs to control how we understand it. And there are other people that say, no, 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 it's a living document that we can make it say really basically what we want it to say. So one says the meaning's in the, under the control of the author. The other one says, no, the meaning's in the hands of the reader. Okay? And there are many people who take that position toward the Bible today. As uh, one person said to me in a conversation, isn't it so great uh, that the Bible can mean so many different things to so many different people? Right? As if the Bible means whatever anybody thinks it means. And my response to this person was, well, if the Bible means anything that any person thinks it means, then really the Bible itself doesn't mean anything. Right? Because it just becomes a text that everybody puts their own meaning in. So, how do we do this? Well, are these the right approaches? Now, here's some common approaches to how people treat the Bible, right? Some people view the Bible like a treasure, treasure chest of important truths. Like, right, if you, you go into Google and you say, I want some good quotes about work, right? I'm going to go in there and find some good quotes from Proverbs or uh, you'll reap what you sow, right, from Galatians or something like that. And so, it's just a treasure chest of important little jewels, like you open up a treasure chest and there's a diamond here and there's a sapphire over here. And these are just important little aphorisms and then you need to kind of put them on a card and then put them around your house or in your car and things like that. And again, nothing necessarily wrong about that, is that but that is, is that really what the Bible is, right? Just little nuggets that we get to go and pick up. And in particular, people often associate those nuggets with verses from the Bible, which verses really are just a device that aren't inspired. They're a device that has been, the church has used to help people navigate around the Bible, but they're not necessarily thought units in and of themselves. They're just ways to help us navigate around. But people have come to say, well, that's where you find a little nugget in there. Or two, it's a great source of comforting and encouraging promises, right? One of the most common ones, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's a great promise, right? That's a great promise. Now, this in particular, uh, people, I love it because it gives great comforting and encouraging words, but there's some other words in there that are warnings, rebukes, other things like that. Well, that doesn't seem to fit into that one, right, in terms of that. And also the treasure chest doesn't seem to work very well for the long story portions of the Bible, right, where it's not just little, uh, like, proverbs. Well, some people, third, say it's a good source for illustrating and supporting what I believe. 
right? So people think, well, if you're among a group of believers, right, or if you're politically, you want to talk to people of faith, well, then you've got to have a little biblical authority behind you. And so here, this is where people want to use the Bible to back up what they already believe. So the Bible is not shaping what they believe. The Bible is used as what they think is an authority they can can pull onto their side uh, to support their belief and get other people of faith either to come to their side or shut up and not oppose them. That's very common. Uh, Fourthly here is a magical charm that brings blessing and protection by having it around. So you just need to have one. It's maybe collecting dust, but you've got to... Uh, you got a Bible in your car, right? You carried around in your pocket, right? This was famous, especially during the war, that you had uh, uh, people carrying a Bible around just because they wanted to make sure they had that. As if you have a Bible, it's like carrying the Ark of Covenant around and you have God's presence with you and it, it Im- endues you with some sort of miraculous protection, right? Not understanding the Bible, not believing the Bible, not following the Bible, but just having the Bible, right? And then the final one, a manual for finding the good life. And there's a number of people around the world, in America and around the world, who say that the Bible, if you, if you listen to it and you trust me and follow me, it's going to make you healthy. God wants you to be healthy. He doesn't want you to be sick. Right? And God wants you to have lots of money, and he wants you to be wealthy. Right? So the Bible is a manual to find health and wealth. Now, what I want to suggest to you is that all of these wind up being these kinds of approaches to the Bible. So here you've got two ladies having a discussion together, and one says, do you even hear the words I say? And she responds, the ones I like. Yes, I do hear those. And often the way we approach the Bible is that, you know, I love the Bible, but I don't like all the Bible. I just, there's certain words in there I really like, like the golden rule, treat others as you would want to be treated, right? Uh, God is good. God is love, right? I love all those statements, but, you know, let's not go too far with that. I just pick the ones I like, and I kind of ignore the ones I don't like. And also, it happens, and many times have I found among believers, uh, I like some that I understand, and there's other ones that are difficult, and I just kind of skip over those until I find something that I like or I get. Right? So we don't want to take an approach to that, and, and the reason why we don't take an approach to that is because it's God's Word. Right? So let's take a look here a little bit further and look at people within the Bible. Matter of fact, two authors of the Bible and the ultimate author of the Bible and look at how they expected the Bible to be interpreted and engaged and responded to. So I just picked three passages. And here's Moses, right, writing in Deuteronomy chapter 6. All kinds of things here. He says, These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe. So Moses is writing these laws down for his people through the generations, and they're meant for them to learn and to live, to observe them, to do them. Right? So they didn't get to pick and choose. Everything that Moses is writing is for them. So observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy a long life, right? You may know God's blessing by being obedient to his word and by keeping him as the supreme authority in your life, right? So he's the authority. And then hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. So here's Moses saying, God has laid out these promises here for the Old Testament people of Israel, is that he's laid out these instructions for you to obey them for your blessing, and so that you can know all the covenant blessings that God wants to give, that gracious arrangement that he brought you into with himself, made you his people, and now he wants to bless you, but you need to obey him, you need to understand what he's taught, and you need to obey his instructions so that you can know blessing. Right? So Moses, that's how he approached it. Now here's Paul, okay? Famous uh, statement here from 2 Timothy, chapter 3. But as for you, Timothy, he's speaking to, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Now here, it's something where the teaching of the Word of God is something that not only he's learned, but now he's convinced of its truth. That's a different stance. There's a lot of people who know the Bible, and know stuff about the Bible, right? In my own education, uh, I read books by people who rejected Jesus Christ, but who could write a very good explanation 
of what Paul understood by justification. And it was good. It was right. It was true to the Bible. But they rejected the Bible. So they learned it, but they weren't convinced of it. And so not only is Timothy to learn and be convinced of it, but he's continuing in it. He's to make it something that continues to shape his life for the whole of his life. He says, because you know those from who you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, the Scriptures are something that makes us wise, gives us a skill in living. It informs us about who God is, who we are, how we have a relationship with Him, how we live out that relationship. So it gives us life-giving wisdom, right? how to have an excellence of life, right, and know the redemption from the sin that we have uh, willfully uh, engaged in through faith in Jesus Christ. And he says all Scripture, everything that God gives us, he's breathed out, it's his very own word, it's useful for teaching, for rebuking, right, drawing people up short when they're heading in the wrong direction, right? How do we know which way to go? Well, we know because God has laid out the path, so he's taught us. And then his word at times rebukes us when we step out of the path of faithfulness to our wife or faithfulness to our husband or we disregard the authority of our parents. Right? So it rebukes us and it corrects us. It not only teaches us the way to go, it not only rebukes us when we get out of the path, but it gives us a correction so that we can get back on the path and it trains us in righteousness. That I think that sums up the three, teaches, rebukes, and corrects so that we can be disciplined and trained in the path of doing what is right. So that the servant ultimately then may be thoroughly equipped for every good work so that we can serve God, we can know life, and we can accomplish what God has called us to do. So that's Paul. Now here, let's turn and look at a word of Jesus, a famous one from Matthew chapter 4, from the temptation scene. That is, he's, uh, as the evil one, interestingly, tries to twist Scripture Right, even quotes scripture to Jesus. And here Jesus, the key thing was who was interpreting it right, who was understanding the scripture rightly. And so Jesus says right at the beginning, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so Jesus said that our lives should hang on every word that comes from the mouth of God. We should trust him for that. He's the one who created us. He's the one who's going to bring everything to fruition at the end. And he's the one that we were created for, right? And the reason our lives are broken in every way that they are broken is because in some way we're alienated from him or we're alienated from the path that he's laid out for us. And so God is to be the controlling uh, force and the authority in our life. So this kind of engagement with the Word of God is not a treasure chest. It's not something we get to pick and choose. It's not a little bit of nuggets that we get to pick and choose if we like them. Uh, especially we like to pick the promises or the comforting words and neglect the warnings, right, that are there. Uh, It's not something that we use, right, to build a life of our own, and we pick and choose different ones as far as we like them, and we attach those to our life to try to give authority to it from God. No, these are God's words that he determines the meaning. So we want to emphasize here, just as we, 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 before we get to some more particulars, is that it assumes in the reading here that the reader's job is to understand and obey. So Moses, Paul, Jesus, what he, what's our responsibility as followers? If we love God and trust Him, our job is to understand what He said and to do what He's told us, right? And that the reader does not determine the meaning, but we're there to discover it. So we go to learn it. We don't go there to put meaning into it. We don't go there to pick and choose and say, I like that verse, I don't like that verse. I love when it says God is love, but I don't like Jesus talking about hell all the time. Jesus, come on, got to get rid of that. So no, no, the reader is there to discover the meaning. And then what the author intended to say is the meaning of the text. And so this is important for us because to interpret the Bible properly, as far as the Bible itself is concerned, the authors of the Bible, is that we understand what God said and so that we respond to it in the way that God intends for us to respond, so that His wishes, His will, His loving guidance shapes our lives. So I just had to get a little alliteration here to try to think about the model that Scripture talks about in terms of that, is that for a follower of Christ, you come to the Scriptures And your motivation is love. And what do I mean by that? You come as one who's been loved by God graciously, uh, uh, inestimably, 
Uh, it's just in a way that's undeservingly. And so you come to the Word of God with gratitude, right? And you're disposed to trust, right? When you know the love of God and you understand what He's done for you, when you approach the Word of God, you don't come with your, your, your hands up and distrust. You don't come up trying to make God prove His way. You don't come and put yourself over against the Word of God. You open yourself up to it in the same way that if you had some loving mom or dad or, or grandma or grandpa or dear friend that's coming to you to bring you advice, you open your heart to them because their love, know, you know that they're on your side. You know that even if they say a hard word, it's going to be for your best. So loved, you come with gratitude, you come with trust in the author, and you come in dependence because you know who he is, right? It's a love that comes in. I don't come to tell God how he should think. I don't come to tell God that, God, I wish you said this a little bit better because it's a little awkward. I don't come to adjust God's thoughts. I come in dependence upon him to have my thoughts adjusted. And so you come with delight, with expectation. So that whole kind of love, you're, you're coming to an encounter with what God has spoken, with a sense of anticipation, and you're coming there with gratitude and trust and dependence right, for him to do his work. And so then you listen, and listen, the goal of listening is not as sometimes husband and wives are sitting there arguing with one another, and I'm listening, it looks like I'm listening, I'm not speaking, my mouth is closed, but really, I'm just formulating my question. I don't care what she says. Rhonda can talk all she wants. She can say what she said. I've already decided what I'm going to say, and I haven't listened to a thing that she just said. So I just talk right back to her afterwards. She responds to me, haven't you heard anything that I said? And so when we come to the Word of God, we don't come to the Word of God right, to prescribe to it. We don't shut our, our, our ears to it. We open our heart to it. And the goal of, of listening is understanding. And at the end, I want to say, I understand, God, what you've said. And then we learn, right? We internalize it. There's a difference between sitting in a class as a professor. I have students who listen to me often, right? But don't internalize what I say, right? That was true of my daughters. It was true of me when I was a son, right? My wife would probably t- tell you it's true of me as a husband, right? All those kind of things. It's different to internalize it, to get it, right? And to take it in and to feel the weight of it right? And as far as Scripture is concerned, to feel the weight of it over against your sin, to feel the beauty of it, to welcome it, to listen, to learn it, and then, of course, to live it, right? And then I want to just suggest to you, it creates this this cycle that builds on itself, because as you love and listen, learn, and live, it increases your sense of God's goodness and grace, and it moves you back and disposes you to greater love and greater engagement with the Scripture. And it's just a process that feeds on itself, right? But again, you come out of it. So here, here's James trying to get at it, one of many different passages. This is a famous one from James chapter 1. Do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Right? I know as a Christian who's grown up in the church, there's been many, many occasions when I have listened but not done what I've heard. And God in His mercy has continued to pursue me to get things that I didn't uh, want to obey. I've even prayed with David, one of my favorite prayers of David and from the Psalms is, God, save me from the sins that I love. God, please, save me. So it says here, do not merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So when you go to the word of God, it exposes you before it. It shows you who you are. And it tells you that you're a created being. It tells you that apart from Jesus, you have no hope. It tells you without God, you can't understand yourself and the world and your neighbor And so when you come there, you come in dependence, and he says, here's who you are. You're my creation. Here's who you were. You were a rebel that was running as hard as you could from me. And here's what I did. I came after you in Jesus, and I rescued you. Now here's your new identity. When you put your faith in me, it made you my son. It made you my daughter. And you have all the riches of God in Christ, and I'm going to eventually give you everything that I promised you. In the meantime, I'm going to grow you into this new identity. But that's who you are. That's not who you are. Don't run after where you used to be. No, no, that's not who you are. Don't listen to those voices, right? So he's saying here, if you're you're listening to do, you come to the Word of God, 
as someone who feels like your life depends and the people in your life depend on you listening to do it. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, that's an interesting, almost like a, 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 a kind of a, a nonsensical, a perfect law. I thought law was supposed to constrain freedom. Right? But here, the perfect law, the law that reveals who we are and who God is and tells us how to really live, it really enables us to truly live. So that's why Jesus would say, I came that you might have life, John 10.10, 10, and you might have it to the full. So the law that gives freedom and continues in it, right? Hold on to it, walk in it, live in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Right? So love, listen, learn, live, and then it disposes us to head back to the top of the cycle, and over and over and over we go. And this is one of the things in a follower of Christ, and I say this all the time, um, one time, one of my daughters said, you know, Dad, what's your hobby? And I have, I have a number of different hobbies. But one of them said, I think it would be, if I would tell it, it would be to you to sit in there and read your Greek New Testament. And that's probably true. That's my hobby, which shows that I'm just a geek, right? But that's just my hobby. And I just sit there. I love to read it. I love to study it. And the thing that's happened to me over time is the Bible has never gotten stale. It just gets richer and deeper. It seems more satisfying, more applicable to life, more it, it describes better and more fully and better than anything else I know. My own life experience and what happens to me helps me understand who I am, helps me to relate to my wife and my kids. So the Bible, continuing it over life, continues to shape. Now, but here I just want to say that how do we listen well? And that's the point of what we talk about. How do we listen well? Because scriptures are full of, of instances where people distort the scriptures. And here, in particular, in 2 Peter chapter 3, he talks about people who are ignorant and unstable people who distort what Paul has written. Right? So the scriptures themselves, just because you're a Christian, just because you know Christ, it doesn't mean that you'll always understand the Bible correctly. The biggest challenge to you understanding the Bible correctly is you. Because in any way that the Bible sets over against sin in your life, when the Bible comes up, as Martin Luther would say, sometimes the Bible greets us as an adversary. It comes up against us and says, Greg, no. It says, Greg, that's wrong. Greg, you're out of sync with God's will for you. Greg, that's a deadly path you're heading on. In that moment, my disposition is I'm struggling against the Spirit who's trying to speak to me and say, Greg, give in to that. Repent of that. And so I may distort the Scriptures simply because I don't trust God enough and I think I know better. And so when he tells me about how to live as a husband and to lay my life down for my wife, I might say, I don't know, God. Do you know how my wife treats me? Do you know how she treats me? I don't think that's right. When she treats me right, and God says to me, Greg, it doesn't depend on how she treats you. You need to treat her this way. I said, but God, right? I know none of you have ever had those conversations with God in your head, right? Those kinds of things here where uh, we distort it because we don't trust God that that path is really the good path. I think I know better, or my culture is pressuring me in a different way, so distort them. And so here in 2 Timothy chapter um, 2, I didn't put that down here in verse uh, 15, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And this is important because 2 Timothy is dealing with people who are in the church who are distorting the nature of the way God saves. And so Timothy has to apply the truth appropriately and interpret it rightly so that the church might not lose its identity and get off mission. So how do we do that? Well, I can't give you a whole course of things and my wife would warn me against it anyway here this morning, but I want to lay out an approach that uh, deserves a lot more elaboration in every step that I'm going to talk about, but talks about given who, the, who's the Bible, uh, who has authored the Bible, given what God's intentions are for how we should engage the Bible. Well, then here's a, a, just a way to think about how we should engage the Bible and how we should think about it. Okay? So here's some things here. One, given who authored the Bible... Given whose book it is, we should come humbly. 
And so here, this is a, from Psalm 25. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. You know, if you, when you come to the Word of God, you stop and, and bow before it and say, it's the God who it, I'm, is addressing me is my Savior. Right, Paul celebrated in Romans chapter 8, everybody knows this verse, if God is for me, if God has delivered me from my rebellion against him, who can be against me? And the answer, no one. But the flip side of that is if God isn't for you, it doesn't make any difference who is. But God the Savior, so I come to him, my deliverance, my understanding of myself, my freedom, my hope, my purpose, my direction, it's all due to him bringing me to my senses and delivering me. So I come, I don't have words of advice to offer him. Right? Paul says at the end of Romans 11, who's ever been God's counselor that could give God some advice? Who's ever put God in his debt so that God owes him something? Well, that's ridiculous. You come humbly under. So we don't come to, to stand alongside the Bible like it's our buddy, God, and, and kind of, he's my buddy, and I just kind of, we're peers. No, we're not peers. I don't stand over the Bible as if I come to judge it and pick and choose the things that I want. No, I come under it because I come under the authority of God. So the first one, we come humbly. And then second, here, we engage prayerfully. So here, uh, another prayer of David's from Psalm 119. Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Right? So here I come to the idea that I know, I know that there's sin within me. As a believer, we know that we're on the way people. And if you don't believe it, right, the common joke is just ask the person who knows you best. Right? You know you haven't arrived yet. You know there's sin in your heart. You know there's lack of trust, lack of faith. And there's just some ignorance that you just don't even know what the Scriptures teach. And also, we have come to the Bible, as we mentioned before, and we've read the same text, but we have never opened our eyes, and we need the work of the Spirit of God. This is David asking for the Spirit's illuminating work. What does the Spirit do? Well, one... When you're saved, when you're a follower of Jesus, he comes in and reorders your life. We call it regeneration. He gives you a new set of dispositions, a new set of loves, a new set of appetites, right? So that it disposes you to want to listen to God, to hear what he has to say, to value his word is important. So the Spirit works in that way. And the Spirit works to enable you to welcome the text when it comes to you, to receive it as something good. The first Thessalonians, Paul talks about how the Thessalonians, when the word of God was proclaimed, they welcomed it by the power of the Spirit. So the Spirit enables us not just to, to want to hear it, but He's the one who enables us to see that it's good and it's true and it's beautiful, and we want to embrace it. And then He's the one that enables us to live into it. So the Spirit is at work, and David here is saying, Lord, do open my eyes. I know my eyes are closed in ways. I know that I'm not open. So open my eyes. So one of the things that my dad taught me when I was young, he said, Greg, when you open those pages, just pause and pray and ask God to open your eyes to see what God has for you. Then thirdly, we need to read carefully. And this is, this is hard today because most of us don't do much reading, right? We wish, God said, watch the YouTube video carefully, right? And then replay it three to four times. Right? And if God really wanted to speak to the present generation, he should have done it, done it on YouTube. Right? Why can't we have all the YouTube, the Bible on YouTube, have people act it out? Right? As, if, as if that's the only way we can understand. But we need to read carefully, and we need to learn how to read our Bibles. Right? They, many of you have heard this over and over again. Uh, if you were on the other side of the world and the only thing you could ever get from the person that you loved was some handwritten letters, you would get them and pour over them. You would read them and read them and read them because they're important to you. The person is important to you. You wouldn't complain about the, the, the venue that he used to communicate to you or she used to communicate to you. You would just be grateful to have them pouring out their life and soul toward you, and you would do everything you could to understand. 
And so here, to read carefully is to let our love for God and our respect for God pour into the way that we engage his words to us. And so what we need to do because of the nature of Scripture, that God worked through human individuals at particular points in time through particular languages to communicate his word for his people through the ages, well, because the Bible is that kind of book, we need to consider history. So when we open our pages of the Bible, often, for example, when you're reading uh, in the New Testament, Jesus will use illustrations from the first century. And we don't think that way culturally. Uh, I just did a wedding over the last weekend. Uh, when you go to a wedding, it's pretty uh, clear that the bride is the star of the show. You don't have to guess about it at all, right? There's the groom standing right next to me. You've got to have a groom to have a wedding, so he's right next to me. And he's got a rented tux on that in particular, this particular thing, the zipper was bust, busted on it. So he's standing there next to me. Then when the bride comes in, right, the groom comes in, he doesn't have a special song. Nobody announces his, right? The only person that cries is the mother when he comes in. Oh, there's my baby, right? So he comes in. We all wait. Special music hits. Everybody stands up, turns around. There's the bride. <gasps> She's beautiful. And the only thing they care about the groom, what, is that they want to look at his face when he sees her the first time. That's it. That's the shot. That's the money shot. Well, here in the biblical world, when Jesus is teaching in the parables, he's calling himself the groom all the time. And in the first century, everybody gathered to wait for the groom. He was the star of the show. You all came to the house. So the virgins were out there with their lamps waiting for the groom to show up. Right? Nobody had their watches, right? those kind of things, waiting for him to show up. So the whole metaphor of the church being the bride and Jesus the groom and everyone waiting for him gets distorted in our cultural lens but we need history to help us, right? We also need to understand how they thought and where they were. And so also language, right? We talked last week about translations. Well, that is the blessing of language and stability to be able to carry the message of the scriptures from language to language. But somebody had to learn Greek and Hebrew. Somebody had to learn Aramaic. And somebody had to study the history of that language so that they could understand what those Greek and Hebrew words meant when they were used. And so the language itself and how it functions, we need to understand it. And people have done that to give us good translations to read. Then we need to pay attention to surroundings. Context is the term that you often hear. Right? We always read the words of God within the context in which it appears. We don't pluck those little treasures right out. So one of the co constant ones is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that gets plucked right out of its context and gets stuck on everything from football games right, to anything that you can imagine, right, I can win. When in reality, what Paul is saying, I have learned that I can hold on to Christ and be obedient to him and know faithfulness to him, whether my life is going really well or my life is going really poorly. I can hold on to him because I've learned how to hold on to Christ. I can do those things through his power. I can be faithful to him. It has nothing to do with winning. As a matter of fact, he says, whether I'm abased or whether I bound, I've learned how to hold on to Jesus. So we look at the surroundings. And that's not just the surroundings of the immediate verse, that's surroundings of the Bible as a whole. So we let the Bible interpret the Bible. Okay? So the best authority on Paul is Paul, and then the next best authority on Paul is the rest of the New Testament, and then the Bible itself. So if the Bible is all God's Word, it should be consistent with all the other parts when it's properly understood. So we pay attention to the surroundings. Literature, we understand that God decided to write to us in very, various types of literature. Sometimes he writes to us in stories, narratives, and those are different. Sometimes he writes to us in letters, right, and, which are organized in kind of sequential, logical thought. But stories have scenes and characters and events and places and plots and development. So we learn how to read stories. And then he writes to us in poetry, and all kinds of images and density of thought. We learn how to read poetry. We learn how to read an epistle, right? All those kind of things. We pay attention. We treat the language according to the way God meant for it to operate. And then finally, we pull in good teachers, good teachers from the history of the church and good teachers from today. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, God has given teachers to the church to enable us to understand his word, right? So there's a lot of things to talk about there. And then we witness faithfully, right? One of the things that God calls for us as people is we're not to bear false witness. So our goal of Bible study is to look at the passage we're studying and to say, this is what God has said, and be a faithful witness. 
Not the, if there's one person I don't want to be a false witness of. That's God and what he says. And so our goal of interpretation is to say, this is what God is saying. And before I can understand what he's saying, I'm not ready to try to live it out. And then he moves on here to apply it uh, discerningly. And this is where many of the questions comes in, especially to Christians today, about why there's certain portions of the Bible that we don't live by. It looks to other people from outside like we just pick and choose certain things and we leave other things behind. Well, it might look that way, but in reality, we're following the directions of God himself in Scripture as to what applies to his people at a given point in time. Because as God reveals his plan and purposes, he does it progressively over time in stages. And so as we look at Scripture, one of the things we look at in terms of application is we want to pay attention to the place we live in the storyline. We're not in the Garden of Eden, that's pretty obvious. We're not in under the law of Moses with the children of Israel. And if we were pagans as we are, we'd have to proselyte and become Jews to be a part of God's people. That was the rules under the law. And we're not in the new heavens and the new earth. I'm looking forward to that, but we're not there. Where we are is we're in that period of God's program after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension and before his return. We're in the period that addresses us directly in the New Testament. So to know where we are, and the reason why we don't offer sacrifices is because Jesus fulfilled what God meant to picture in those sacrifices. He is the sacrifice of all sacrifices. So I don't decide, I don't like blood sacrifice, so I'm just going to leave it out. No, God says that was a picture of what Jesus fulfilled. And if you go back and sacrifice, you're denying Jesus' identity. So I'm not going to go back there. And also, I don't have a priest anymore because Jesus is my mediator now to God. We have one mediator, Paul says in 1 Timothy. So we don't have priests. We have pastors. We have priests, not priests. And so also here, we look at the original audience. Who was it directed toward? Was it Israel, the church? Was it a particular person? Was it a group of people based on their age or gender? And we need to carefully think about that because it may not be directly applicable to me in terms of the direction. Right When it says in Titus chapter 2 that uh, women are to disciple women, right? that's not speaking to me at all other than the fact that I, as a pastor or as a husband or as a brother, will be encouraging women to disciple each other. But it's not telling me how to disciple women other than to say to encourage them to disciple each other. So it's not directly to me, and I don't apply that to me in that way. And I look at the original situation. What is it they're trying to address? So it's giving me wisdom about God's taking these principles and bring it to bear on this problem. And then also, I want to look at what the enduring truths are. And so based on the storyline, based on the audience, based on the situation, what are the things that God makes clear are things that are true for me and for all time that still embrace me at the present? So as I've said already, it's very clear. We don't have a tabernacle that we pick up every time and wander around Xenia and then rebuild it in a different place. Well, the reason why we don't do that, even though there's very explicit directions, is because God himself in the Old Testament set that aside and built a temple. And then when Jesus came, he didn't encourage them to build a temple. He told them, you are the temple. So God has moved forward in his purposes. And so we don't do those things because we're not that place in the storyline. But if we were in the wilderness, we'd be in a tabernacle. So the idea here on the storyline. And so we're not the children of Israel. We're the people of God on the other side of the ministry of Christ. And so we listen to his uh, claims. And so we discern what are the the enduring truths, and then we connect them to our life today. We look for situations that are similar to the situations being addressed in the first century and apply those to our life. So in Philippians, dealing with a broken church, for example, that has relationally fallen apart at the seams, there is all kinds of wisdom for how to strengthen and maintain relationships. So we try to apply that that way. And then finally, we respond willingly. So Scripture assumes that we just don't listen, we obey. And we figure out what it is that God demands of us, and we move in that direction. So whether it is that we, that we come to church together and gather as God's people, it seems uh, 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 impossible to read the Scriptures and think that you could be a lone ranger for Jesus. And people who think that that I don't need to be a part of a church, I don't need to be a part of the body of Christ, 
are disobeying the very way that God has designed his people to work and to be. Maybe we need to step out in ministry to help someone. Maybe we need to to bow on our knees in prayer or request or supplication. Maybe we need to just join in praise and just the response of it is just say, God, you're good and great. As we read our scriptures. So this is why the kind of model that's often encouraged in a very short and brief one that I've talked about here is our, our first job first is to understand. So as we move toward the scriptures that interpret them, we don't begin with our ideas and look for confirmation. We come to the scriptures to understand them first, and then we summarize what they're teaching, and then we move forward to say, how does that impinge upon our life today? Now, it's not something that, that most of you know, and I haven't answered all the particular questions, but let me just give you one example here as I come to the end uh, of my time with you this morning. And I want you to look at James chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And I give you this example. I've used it in other classes of mine because James here uh, does exactly what uh, God encourages us to do with Scripture everywhere. And James just does it all together right here in one little passage. Uh, he, he, he comes to a problem that's happening in the church, churches that he's addressing here. These are really refugees who are gathering in small little gatherings. And what they've done is they need jobs, they need protection, they're desperate. And so what they do in the ancient world is they look to people who have power, people who have resources. And so they look to rich people, and they've invited them into their little assemblies, their little gatherings, their sunugoge. They've, they've invited them in. And what they're doing is they're using their social capital and this patron-client relationship. They're sucking up to these powerful people by giving them positions of honor in their churches, hoping that these people of power will give them jobs and security and protection. But all the while, these people that they're honoring in their churches are people who curse the name of Jesus. And so all the while, they're taking the people who are real kingdom people, who believe in Jesus, they're kicking them to the back of the church and telling them, just because you're a kingdom person, you have nothing to offer to me. What really matters is job and security, and these unbelievers have it. So they're discouraging the believers from thinking that they're really wealthy when they are, And they're encouraging these lost people to think that they are wealthy when they're really poor. So they're hating their wealthy, unbelieving neighbor, and they're hating their brother. It's hate everywhere. Because they're discouraging them from believing the truths about what really matters. And so James steps into this and he says, My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, you must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? What they're evidencing is they don't believe the truth that every believer, even if they're abjectly poor, even if they have no power or influence, are inestimably rich. And every unbeliever, no matter how how powerful they are, no matter how many riches they have, if they don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, are abjectly poor, truly poor. But you have dishonored the poor, Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, you love your neighbor. So here he ties it the big command, right? The two commands that govern the whole Bible. Jesus says, well, I can sum up the Bible here. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But the first command shapes the second command. What it means to love your neighbors determined by who God created them to be and what he wants to redeem them to become. So you should be loving your neighbor consistent with who they are and what God intends for them. You're not loving them, you're hating them. And he's getting the specific part. Love your neighbor, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker. For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. 
For he who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder if you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder. You have become a lawbreaker. Now, James seems to anticipate people are saying, no, but, but we believe the scriptures. No, but at home, we, we treat each other okay. And James is saying, I don't care what other things. You're, you're a lawbreaker and you don't trust God's word because in this area, you're just saying, I can't trust God to be faithful to him and to the identity of his people. I need to work a better way because I need a job and I need some protection. And God says, you're a lawbreaker. And he says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So here, the author's, author's specific message, if I'll put it this way, is honor, give places of prominence in gatherings to poor brothers in a manner appropriate to their status in God's eyes. Right? And so here there's something, there's a command for us to take away from this. We're to honor our brothers and sisters. We're to honor them. It has nothing to do with their material status or their power or anything. They are kingdom citizens and we're to honor them as God's kingdom people. They are nestly rich. They've been empowered by the Spirit. They have resources. We need to honor them. Okay? Now, when we think about our present situation, how, what positions of honor do we have in our church? Where do we put people up in honor? Right? Do we at Emmanuel have places where we honor people that we shouldn't honor? Right? The broader principles here is <coughs> do not show favoritism. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? Notice these are broader principles that are made specific here. They're not loving their neighbor. They're not making the appropriate judgments about who is who. There's so many Christians I meet sometime that they would rather be associated with a person who hates Jesus and denies the resurrection than their goofy brother, sister in Christ who just gets some things wrong or who's immature. Because they don't want to be associated with that anti-intellectualism. They don't want to be associated with that rube over there. They don't want to be associated with that, that, that lack of awareness of the culture and so forth and so on. But they would certainly rather be identified with a person who curses Jesus and have the uh, appreciation of the culture at large, then they would say, I, you're my brother, you're broken, I love you, we need to love each other, but I'm, I'm too ashamed of you to identify with you. And so the original situation is you had rich landowners exploiting the poor in a time when Christian communities are vulnerable in the face of persecution. Many Christians around the world are facing this today. What would be situations that we might find here? Migrant workers or farmers that get exploited. Sweatshops, garment industry, the poor generally, rich and, and powerful. Are there areas in our own culture, in our own experience, at our own jobs, where we're not loving our neighbors? Is there places where we're honoring people based on a worldly rubric as opposed to a godly one? And so then we need to apply specifically if we had in our congregation specifically, if we had seats of honor and we were bringing people up who cursed Jesus and we were honoring them and putting them in the front, James would say, stop that. We don't have those. But are there ways in which we're doing that in our lives? James would want us to do it. So here, to conclude the time here. From what we learned so far, in the Bible, God tells us about who he is, who we are, his loving purposes for all people, and the world he created, and he invites people into a life-giving relationship with him despite their rebellion against him. The meaning of the Bible is what God intends for it to say. The goal of interpretation is to understand and live out what God requires of us for our blessing, our protection, and our mission in our moment. And then finally, the Bible applies today and every day until Christ returns. And as Christ left when he commissioned at the end of Matthew, go into all the world and teach them everything that I've taught you. And I'm with you even to the end of the age. As you gather in your groups today, I just want to encourage you. Uh, don't forget in the midst of what we're up to, uh, share prayer requests, pray for one another. Continue to build your relationship with each other. But I want to encourage you, and you'll see these on the notes, to talk about your own Bible reading plans. What are you doing uh, and as uh, individuals reading? Uh, and this is an opportunity for you guys to be honest with each other. We're going to find that some of us, yeah, we're reading. Others of us aren't. But we want to be encouraging one another because of who the author of the book is and what he promises for us. 
to give, hear, give a hearing to God's word. We need to find a place for it if we haven't. He invites us to it. Also, I want to ask you as a group, if you want to write down some things, if you're looking at, I know I had a lot of things here this morning that could have a lot more clarification. I'd love some feedback from you about some things you'd like to hear about more in depth as you do that. And then I'm going to encourage you to go to James chapter 2, and I'm going to give you a little rubric here about uh, how to draw out some specific applications, to do a little work of that for yourself. I think one of the ways that Bible study often fails is it never works its way down to life. And so people, just like they walk along the edge of the seashore and the, the waves lap on their feet and they never fully get wet, that's what often happens when people read their scriptures. And then Steve is going to come next week and talk a little bit more about the practical side of the practice of Bible reading. Now, I want to, inclu- I want to conclude and take you to a passage that is a very familiar one, and we talked about this passage very often when we were in our ser- sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. But I don't know if you ever thought of your Bible reading as Jesus sitting there as the ruling, reigning Lord of His church, and He's saying to you, Greg, He's saying to you, Kristen, He's saying to you, Sarah, He's saying to you, James, He's saying, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Lord of our church invites us to his written word that he gave to us through his authorized agents to give us hope and peace and guidance to lift our burdens because his yoke, his word, his truth, his way is easy. And he invites us to come, be unburdened. Pray with me, would you? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercies to us today. Lord, it's, it's hard for us to imagine so often that your goodness and your kindness, that your patience, Lord, that you're rich in mercy and slow to anger. And Lord, you have given us your word. And Lord, it's really uh, it's heart, heartbreaking and shameful at the way we often just neglect to come and hear and listen and learn of you. Lord, I know that's true in my own heart. I know that, Lord, we often, just as you admonished, Lord, through Moses and Paul, sometimes we, we don't continue. Uh, some of us are living off of fumes of things that we've learned a long time ago, and we really are not spending any time letting you teach us. We're not learning of you. Lord, in this moment of crisis, Lord, we need to hear our shepherd's voice uh, we need you to guide us. We need you to remind us of who we are. We need to remind us of who you are. We need to remind us of your future for us and of the resources that we have day in and day out. God, husbands need to be reminded of who they are. Wives need to be reminded. Children need to be reminded. Grandmas and grandpas. And Lord, we need to be reminded of the lostness of the world around us, of how and what it means to love our neighbors. So Lord, help us. Lord, we want to come and be unburdened. Lord, we want to learn of you. So we pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. God bless you.